Hi, I'm Pete Doctor, and this is The Breakdown. I grew up loving animation, feeling like this is really what I was born to do. And I think I started when I was like eight. I started working professionally when I was 15. And uh, then after Inside Out, I was like, you know, this is probably as good as it gets. I can't imagine doing anything that would su supersede that in terms of audience appreciation and box office and critical acclaim. And then I was like, now what? Do I, I, do I just go back and do it, do it again? Or is there something that maybe I'm missing? Because I still don't feel like it like, fixed everything and made me all whole or whatever. So um, started just wondering, like, it, you know, I think a lot of us grew up with that idea, like you find what you love, pursue that, and you will never work a day in your life. You'll be happy. And, uh, you know, I don't know that that's always the case. So this film is really kind of an un unpacking or an investigation into what is it to live? You know, what's, what's going on in this place? Well, the first challenge was not pissing off half the world's population because, you know, there are obviously a lot of different ideas about what happens after we die. So we decided, well, actually, what's good about this idea is that it doesn't really need to get into that. We did explore it a little bit, but primarily the movie takes place before life, so before we're born, and there are very few traditions actually that talk about that. So then we get to make it up, but then um, the challenge with that, of course, is there's very little to look at uh, for reference. Um, we did do a lot of research. We talked to rabbis and priests and Buddhists and all sorts of folks just to learn what we could, but um, you know, most people said, oh, the souls are ethereal, ethereal they're non-physical, they're invisible. Um, not very helpful in terms of hints for how to design things. So we, we tried to nod to that stuff by making them foggy and vaporous and so on. I think actually our character designer, Albert Lozano, had said, what, what if you made an icon of someone, but without using them, their looks as a guide? And so it's like the distilled down, simplified, absolute reductionist, uh, details that I would need to create uh, the look of somebody uh, in this in this form and in fact before you're born the souls that haven't lived yet they're even simpler they don't even have arms and legs unless they need them if they need to grab something they can whoop, you know it appears um, but uh, that was kind of part of the fun of it is just okay this is kind of impossible how are we gonna do it and uh, luckily we have really talented people to, <laughs> to, to figure that stuff out is this heaven <laughs> no. Is it H E double hockey sticks? Hell, 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 Actually, I asked one of the people, could you build me a four-dimensional character? You know how, like, if you see a tesseract, it's like this weird unfolding three-dimensional thing that's... And, and they said, yeah, technically we could. Um, but this ended up being kind of enticing. It's, it's like a Picasso or a... Um, or Alexander called it like a wire, a wire sculpture. We also, we were really inspired by a lot of um, modernist Nordic sculpture. I don't know why, but that, that came up a lot. Um, and so all those things kind of folded into this, just, it's kind of that brain tease of, okay, it's 2D, but it's 3D. It's like what, you know, like if you take a piece of wire and you bend it around, it's, it's got dimension, but from the camera's point of view, it's flat until it turns. And then I don't, it just was really intriguing. And also unlike anything we'd ever done, which is also intriguing. <laughs> it's not like Inside Out where you're cutting inside different locations you know every couple seconds but still we wanted it to be very clear this is the world this is the ethereal non-physical space the other dimension and um i think too you know just as we chose jazz jazz comes with its own kind of design language you look at great album covers from the 50s and the 60s there's great kind of graphic shaped things with strong rhythm and and color and and so we we were inspired a lot by that as well in terms of trying to make New York City very identifiable and recognizable, but also kind of turn the volume up a little, you know, make it 
its own thing, stylize that. It also ended up being, like a lot of times you make these choices and then you can't really fully define them unless you have something to oppose it. So having the world, and this is tactile and hard-edged and angular, and then we have the ethereal world, and that's soft and fuzzy and round shapes. And so those two, I think, define themselves in opposition to each other. The Lost Souls are meant to basically it's funny, when we started, I was just recognizing there are people that you see sometimes, you know, homeless folks or you meet them in life that you just feel like, oh, they, they're they lost. They're just kind of aimlessly wandering through life. And it felt like polar opposite to Joe who feels like, I have a goal, I have a drive, I have a passion that I'm following. But as we got into the storytelling, I started to recognize, you know, the there have been times in my life when I am so single-mindedly passionate and focused that I become a lost soul, that I start blocking out the rest of the world, and there's something really intriguing about that. So as we talked about that, I think it was Steve Pilcher, who's the production designer, came up with these really kind of cool, blobby, haunted forms, and uh, they're wandering uh, through this ethereal astral plane looking for what they think is the answer to life blind to it all the time so that was um, Kind of where that all came from I recognize as as an artist as a an animator There were many times like I mean I even working on Toy Story that I was so into it that you just it's almost like and you they, they've been studies done on this with uh, musicians and uh, um, especially um, uh, athletes that it's almost like your vision is affected and the rest of the world just goes and you, you you narrow in and you're so focused on what it is it's a it's a high it's like a natural high and then three hours later you you kind of wake up and you're it felt like five minutes you know you're just so into what you're doing Uh, sorry, I zoned out a little back there. <laughs> that felt really intriguing because I'd heard musicians talk about that as well. It felt like something very common amongst people who really love what they do. But uh, similarly, it can be kind of a, like the Lost Soul conversation, can be kind of like a trap or, or something that you get stuck there. We first came up with the idea, I came up with the concept of uh, uh, an area that would be defining of souls, you know, the great before, or as we kind of call it in the movie, the U Seminar. The great before? Oh, we call it the U Seminar now, rebranding. And the first draft, I think, was all set there. It was kind of a heist movie. It was these two characters trying to get another pass, an Earth pass, so that the one could get back. But we never really went down to Earth. And then as we got into it, we realized, oh, you know, what we're really doing with this film is kind of arguing what is the point of life. And so it's very passive to sit here and look at pictures. You know, we had Joe bringing up moments of his life and telling 22, hey, look at this. This is why this was so cool. But it's like watching movies in a movie and the characters have no effect on that. And so it was very passive. So we decided, okay, we got to send them down to earth. And then we were looking really to find something. I think it was around that same time. We were looking to find Joe reflecting kind of my own thing of, of having a passion and a, a singular focus. Animation is not maybe the most exciting thing to watch on screen. It's fun to watch the final product, but as it's being done, it's a lot of clicking and mouses moving and stuff. So we thought, well, mid musician, we explored a bunch of stuff. Actually, we had one version where Joe was an actor, but he kind of came off like he was trying to get rich and famous. So when we hit on musician, and specific, specifically jazz, I grew up loving jazz. I really, uh, it speaks to me for whatever reason. And um, we found this story that Herbie Hancock told about playing with Miles Davis. I think this must have been in the 60s. And they were doing a tour of Europe said it was a great tour and then he said there was this one concert it was so great and then in the middle of all, all of it I played this chord and he says it was so wrong that I worried that I ruined the whole concert and he said but instead of judging him Miles Davis just looked over played some notes and made that chord right and he's like how did it took me years to figure out how he did that what he did was he didn't judge it 
He just took it as something new that happened and did what any great jazz musician should try to do is to take anything that happens and turn it into something of value. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, this is exactly what we're trying to say with this movie. It's such a great metaphor. The idea of improvisation is what we're doing in our lives. We're just walking through. And in a perfect world, we're making the best out of what we have. And uh, so jazz became not only kind of a surface level integral part of the film, but a very deep uh, thematical thing as well. Once we picked jazz and we were looking for like centers of great jazz, you have of course uh, New Orleans, but um, there'd already been a film from the Disney legacy set there as Princess and the Frog. So we thought, well, New York is pretty classic as well. And it's a, it's a place, you know, you play at places like the, we made this up, the half note, but it's clearly based on, you know, a bunch of different clubs that we, uh, we saw actually in lower Manhattan and out in the uh, outer burbs as well. So we made a visit there. We took tons of pictures. We tried to capture kind of the essence of it in the same way, like when you do a caricature of a person, it's not a photograph. It's not exactly, but it has the flavor of uh, of of the neighborhoods and we tried to be as specific as we could. Traditionally Pixar we tend to do very kind of classic Hollywood type of scores with big orchestra 110 piece you know with Randy Newman uh, or Michael Giacchino or any of our great cl collaborators and typically what we do is we'll wait till the very end we kind of almost lock it to the frame and then we hand it to them and they post score it. In this case I felt like I don't know there's something about this movie that wants a different approach and so I was lucky to have worked with Ren Kleiss, this amazing sound designer on Inside Out. Ren is also longtime uh, associates and friends with um, David Fincher. And so of course had worked with Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. And so I was having lunch with him one day and said, do you think those guys would ever do anything? Like, I know it's a stretch because you know, girl with the dragon tattoo, in a Pixar film might, I don't know how that would work, but but I mean, I just love the way they think. Very smart people creatively. And uh, he went and asked them and it turns out they were really keen. They were a little scared, as were we. But I think we both had to kind of stretch and maybe meet somewhere that was beyond where we initially thought we were gonna go and, and that produced some really cool stuff. And then we uh, decided, well, look, we're gonna need somebody to perform so that we can really animate to their um, performance. We, we were lucky enough to meet John Batiste, who of course uh, is band leader on Colbert's program. And he was just fantastic, not only as a performer, but as a knowledge base for the life of a musician, um, helping us even, I don't think he knows this, but he helped us craft the script. You know, things he would say about watching musicians or what he was fascinated by, or even um, situations in his own life when he didn't say get a gig or whatever and understanding all that kind of behind the scenes stuff it was really key uh, to for us in, in writing the film and so as much as Jamie Foxx is the voice of Joe John Batiste is like the hands of Joe working in editorial that's where we really designed um, where how much time we were gonna spend where and of course that's all driven by storytelling but I will say, you know, like I mentioned a minute ago, typically we lock the picture, give it to our composers. In this case, Trent and Atticus were giving us score as we were writing the pieces. So we'd be in the middle of reworking dialogue and entire big beats and they would be like, here's seven different cues that maybe one of them will work. And they'd upload them somewhere and we'd listen to them and go like, well, that one's great. But this one, actually, we could use that over here in the movie. And so it was much more of an organic process. They, they did a lot of demos um, that then we would plug in. We would maybe distort them or copy paste them a couple times to make it fit to picture and then they would go back and reform those to to make it more to you know to, to really work. So it was an iterative organic process that was unlike anything we'd done before. We were lucky on this film to uh, pretty much get everybody we asked. You know we were looking for someone that for Joe, uh, could play comedy because we wanted him to be a fun character uh, who also could do drama, who understood music. Of course, Jamie could do all, he's like, I don't did you know he was a, he was trained as a classical pianist. That's where he, he majored in school and he's amazing. You know, he, he not only knows music, he can do it. Like he, he knows it, knows it. Um, 
So that was pretty cool. And of course, he never stops. He just has energy to burn. And I think he brought that to the character as well. Joe became much cooler as a result of uh, Jamie Foxx. I think he was a little bit more of a schlubby nerd in our first drafts. For 22, we wanted somebody, you know, the whole character is kind of like a teenager who thinks like, I already know all this. Just, uh, you know, forget it. I, I want no part of it. So we kind of thought of uh, the character like that. And uh, Tina, Tina Fey is, of course, so smart and intelligent. And, and <laughs> I think we read in her um, bossy pants, her biography, that early uh, on in, in high school or junior high, she made friends because she was really good at mocking other people, <laughs> standing off to the side and making, you know, remarks. And so 22, we really think, think of her quite like that. It is an honor having you prepare 22 for Earth. I'm gonna make you wish you never died. Most people wish that 22. <laughs> Off you go, bye! And then from there we just, we wanted to make sure that we had a very international cast because even though it takes place largely in New York, the great before is meant to be uh, international. We didn't want to accidentally say everybody's secretly, you know, English or whatever. Um, so the casting is really, I think it's one of our most international casts that we've ever had in a Pixar film. We would always imp uh, encourage them to improvise. We'd come with a script, obviously, and we know exactly what we want. But then we'd, oftentimes I would just say, well, how would you say this? What, what, put it in your own words or play around with it or whatever. And so um, we got a lot of great gifts from our actors that way. There's so many great stories in jazz uh, that, that kind of reference that same um, improvisation as metaphor. Um, there's a great story of Keith Jarrett playing a concert in Köln, Germany. I think he was flown there and he gets there. It's set up by this kid who loves jazz and the piano barely plays. It's out of tune. Half the notes don't work. Uh, the action is all weird. And he's like, no, no, I can't. But you know, the kid's like, oh, please, Mr. Mr. Jarrett. And so they tune the piano he plays and he quickly realizes I can't use these notes. And it turns out because of those restrictions, it became one of those pivotal defining albums for him. This concert, the way he had to play changed his approach and those limitations proved to bring forward something really different and beautiful. And even though it's uncomfortable, I think uh, making this movie along the way, we had a lot of situations like that where like, okay, this is not, not only is this not the plan, this is actually feels like it's hurting us, but because of just pushing you a little out of your comfort zone, it led us to some really great different ways of thinking and approaching uh, the filmmaking. We started five years ago, so it took about four years. Um, we were within seven weeks of finishing picture when COVID hit. And for a while we were like, well, I guess that's it. That's the end of that one. But um, systems, our systems people had set up a really uh, pretty, well, I think it's because of all their forward planning. It was ready to go. People were able to take these little Tiradigi boxes home and we finished animation, effects work, lighting, all from, you know, 200 homes around the Bay Area. So it's pretty, pretty amazing.